Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we talk with Urs Krug, a scientist based in Switzerland and a member of IPPNW, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. We talk about nuclear issues in Switzerland and the upcoming Nuclearization of Africa Symposium set for this November in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we get an update on today's depressing Trans-Pacific Partnership Senate win for President Obama with an eye to what it means regarding nuclear issues. Those interviews, plus numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than clearly is understood by the totality of the U.S. Senate, all of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June 23rd, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Let's start with some good news, because it looks like Sister Megan Rice is finally and irrevocably going to be free. The 85-year-old nuclear protest nun, as she has been called, and her two cohorts broke into the Y-12 National Security Complex in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to protest the building of nuclear weapons and encourage the beating of swords into plowshares. For this, she and the others were convicted on treason charges. She got three years, they got five. For sabotage. That conviction was thrown out last month by the U.S. District Court of Appeals, and now the U.S. Attorney's Office in Knoxville, Tennessee, has announced that the Justice Department would not seek a rehearing by the full U.S. Court of Appeals, nor would it ask the Supreme Court to review the case. Sister Megan, Michael Wally, and Gregory Borcha Obed have all been out of jail since that ruling came down. Now their pro bono attorney, Mark Shapiro, said that all three already had served more time than necessary given the one remaining charge. So the sabotage charge is gone forever, and the lower court had not yet set a date for resentencing of any of the defendants based on the one remaining charge. However... It looks like it's going to be time served, and you are free. I guess the government decided it didn't want to risk the additional negative publicity that persecuting an 85-year-old nun would entail. Nuclear Hot Seat's interviews with Sister Megan and her two cohorts can be found on episode number 205. Pope Francis issued his encyclical last week on climate change, and came out incontrovertibly against those who deny that climate change is real and are refusing to do anything about it. So far, so good. He did speak out against nuclear weapons, but there was nothing specific in the encyclical dealing with nuclear energy. Big potential loophole there. However, Last March, a story in Manichi Shinbun reported that in an audience with Japanese bishops, Pope Francis criticized nuclear power by comparing it with the Tower of Babel and said, human beings should not break the natural laws set by God. A reference to the biblical story that when human beings attempted to reach heaven, they triggered their own destruction. In the encyclical, he did say, If objective information suggests that serious and irreversible damage may result, a project should be halted or modified, even in the absence of indisputable proof. However, the Vatican is a member of the pro-nuclear International Atomic Energy Agency, and there was nothing specific in the encyclical against nuclear. If you wish to make your feelings about nuclear known to the Pope, you can tweet him. His handle is at Pontifex, P as in Peter, O-N-T-I-F like Frank, E-X. Okay, let's look at the Pacific Ocean, which is not a happy thing these days. Right now, a toxic red algae bloom has been killing millions of red tuna crabs, which are washing up on the shores of beaches up to a foot or more deep. Large purple blobby slugs known as sea hares 
along with tuna crabs, are washing up along the San Francisco area. From San Diego up to Alaska, there have been reports of sea lion, dolphin, and pelican deaths. At least nine fin whales have been found dead in Alaska. What's going on? The experts are saying that this is unusual and mysterious and perplexing. A Professor Kate Wynn, University of Alaska Marine Mammal Specialist, went so far as to say, So far, there is no smoking gun in this environmental mystery. But no one is saying the F word, Fukushima, is a possible underlying cause. I will address this further in today's final thought. And for those who still might think that Fukushima is on the other side of the ocean and not important to us, the Weather Channel reports that in November, the Canadian government detected airborne elements of radioactive pollutants in seawater vegetation off the shores of British Columbia. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has admitted that no dose of radiation is safe for the eyes and any dose can cause cataracts. However, it is being criticized by some in the mining industry for ignoring further findings of the International Commission on Radiological Protection, or ICRP, regarding cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease, and that the only findings they are discussing are those dealing with cataracts, We'll have links to both of these articles up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under today's episode, number 209. Our U.S. Government at Work Censored and heavily redacted emails from U.S. government scientists and officials reveal that there were major concerns among American policymakers shortly after the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster that there would be widespread radiological contamination. Nuclear science experts were clearly concerned that radioactive fallout from the disaster would not merely spread to the U.S. West Coast, but cause a spike in thyroid cancer rates there as well, though none of those concerns were publicized by reports or expressed publicly by the Obama administration at that time or any time since. Today, Tuesday, June 23rd, President Obama got a major win as the Senate gave him approval to fast-track the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a top-secret trade agreement that looks like something the Soviet Union would have supported back in the old days of the Cold War. The TPP, as it's called, among other names not necessarily appropriate for a family-oriented show such as this one, allow for radioactive food from Fukushima, or anywhere, to be imported to the U.S. without any need for testing or labeling of country of origin. And that's only one of the myriad problems for the American public that will be created should this trade agreement pass, and it now appears likely that it will. The issues of the TPP are both complex and confusing to the casual listener. So to get a better of idea of just what happened today, and what it means, I spoke with Adam Weissman, a spokesperson for Global Justice for Animals and the Environment. If it sounds like he's in a boiler room, in a way he is, because he is surrounded in the background by activists calling legislators in the wake of today's decision. Adam, would you tell us where we stand with the TPP and what's going on right now? Well, what happened today in the Senate was the Senate voted for uh, the Senate to do a cloture vote on Fast Track Authority. Fast Track Authority is a legislation designed to railroad bad trade deals through Congress by forcing Congress, after the President has already signed trade agreements, to vote on them within 60 days in the House, 90 in the Senate, with no amendments. They are not allowed to amend the legislation in any way. They are limited to 20 hours of floor debate, which in the House, according to Congressman Alan Grayson, means that each member if each member wanted to testify, it would be limited to 88 seconds of floor testimony. They're not allowed to hold up the legislation in committee. They can't filibuster. It is basically designed to turn Congress into a rubber stamp for executive negotiated trade agreements. The Constitution it explicitly puts the power to manage our commercial relations with other countries in uh, our commercial agreements in Congress's hands, not in the White House's hands. So this is a delegation of congressional authority to the executive branch that the executive branch has used time and again to pass trade agreements for the benefit of corporate interests. 
for, uh, attacking public interest regulation in the name of, uh, of eliminating quote unquote non tariff barriers to trade and creating sets of rules that benefit corporate interests from limiting access to affordable medicines by expanding corporate patent rights on drugs to limiting internet freedom again through intellectual property rules to creating new rights for corporate investors which in particular for people concerned about the nuclear threat is very relevant because there's a case under similar investment rules where Germany is being sued for its nuclear phase out for massive sums for billions by a foreign investor that claims that it wants compensation for its lost potential future profits in the German market because of that phase out. So that should concern us with TPP and with the other trade deals currently being negotiated, like the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and the Trade and Services Agreement, these deals really are designed to advance corporate interests, not the public interest, and fast-track the legislation that just hit cloture in the Senate today, which passed cloture in the Senate, is designed to facilitate the passage of those bad trade deals. Now that the Senate has cloture, the House has already passed fast-track. The Senate now has cloture, meaning they've crossed the 60-vote threshold by which they can prevent any filibuster and can move ahead on the timetable established by majority leader. So now it'll be a matter of going to a majority vote in which, since they were able to cross the 60 vote threshold, they will almost certainly be able to get to that uh, majority vote. What we know from past trade deals is that every trade deal that has ever gone to Congress under fast track rule has succeeded. They've passed. And Congress really does is nothing more at that point than just sort of a, form, a formality giving final approval to nego- uh, uh, agency to agreements, rather, negotiated by the executive branch. So the challenge now for activists who want to stop deals like TPP, who are concerned about things like how TPP will undermine food safety standards and could mean more imports of provide food, uh, more imports of radiated food. Uh, our job now has become much harder. We need to do what's never been done before, really, and stop fast-track trade deals from passing Congress. That is something that I think many people will find a demoralizingly daunting task. But, unfortunately, that is where we're at right now. As difficult as that may sound, and it is difficult, the alternative of allowing these agreements to pass through Congress without putting up a fight is even more odious. Because what these deals hold in store from us, from giving corporations the power to attack our environmental laws, from to undermining labor rights and contributing to outsourcing of jobs, to undermining constitutional separation of powers through this fast track legislation itself, and the way that it facilitates trade deals that really circumvent Congress's oversight and authority by taking Congress out of the loop, we really should not accept trade deal negotiated in this model and should do everything we can to put up opposition to them, as unlikely as it may be at this point that we can stop them. We also should hold accountable those members of Congress who chose to join President Obama and the Republican leadership in both houses and with the corporations in standing against the public interest and standing against the rank and file of the Democratic Party in both houses and standing against a broad spectrum of social movements, environmental, faith, labor, access to medicines, food justice, animal welfare, the family farmers, a broad spectrum of movements united against these deals. And, and in fact, many Republicans and conservative activists uh, were opposed to the threat to sovereignty posed by these agreements and the threat to uh, constitutional separation of powers. So these Democrats who stood against the public interest and for the corporate interest, for the interest of their corporate donors, which has been well documented, that the corporations paid richly for these votes, were Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, Senators Michael Bennett of Colorado, Maria Cantwell of Washington, Tom Parker of Delaware, Chris Coons of Delaware, Diane Feinstein of California, Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota, Claire McCaskill of Missouri, Bill Nelson of Florida, Tim Kaine of Virginia, Patty Murray of Washington, Jean Shaheen of New Hampshire, and Mark Warner of Virginia. It is my personal opinion that anyone listening to this should pick up a phone today, tomorrow, and every day and let your senator know that you are aware of this vote, that you will not forget this vote, and that you will remember this vote on Election Day 
And just as these senators have voted to outsource U.S. jobs and the effect of killing U.S. jobs, that you are now committed to killing their jobs and making sure that these people are not going to be sent back to Washington because they are unfit to legislate. They do not represent the people who vote for them. They represent merely the corporations who fund them. And so they do not deserve their jobs as representatives of the public because they are not representatives. That was Adam Weissman, spokesperson for Global Justice for Animals and the Environment and Trade Justice New York Metro. To learn more, you can go to tradejustice.net or gjae.org, and those initials stand for Global Justice Animals Environment.org. From the Hanford site in Washington State comes word that even though the federal government has spent $19 billion to clean up the site, it could still explode. Hanford was part of the World War II-era Manhattan Project to produce plutonium for our first nuclear weapons and generated 56 million gallons of radioactive waste by the time operations were closed in 1987. The risk of explosion increases as hydrogen, an extremely flammable gas, builds in tanks used to contain the radioactive waste. The most recent measurement of one underground high-level waste tank showed a high risk of explosion or fire due to an increased concentration of hydrogen. This according to an April 2015 Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board report. An explosion like that could spread radioactive material across Washington State and into Oregon, Idaho, Utah, and Canada. And earlier this month, the Pentagon published a 1,204-page document on its interpretation of the laws of war and determined that depleted uranium weapons are legal and acceptable. Acceptable to whom or to what besides the Pentagon was not mentioned. Over to Japan, where on June 19th, TEPCO announced that they had measured one million becquerels of strontium-90 per cubic meter in the ocean at two locations in Fukushima Plants Port. This is the highest reading in recorded history. And when we talk about the port seawater, we're talking about the Pacific Ocean. Major newspapers seem to be getting around to asking the question, where did Fukushima's melted fuel go? And the answer is a big, resounding, duh. Experts have yet to pinpoint the exact location of the melted fuel or what condition it is in. According to Arnie Gunderson, chief engineer of Fairwinds Energy Education, the problems we face at Fukushima are unprecedented in part because the previous worst accident in the nuclear world, Chernobyl, had a core that never hit groundwater. It stayed in the building and remained dry, while we have three nuclear cores in Fukushima in contact with groundwater. And yet, in spite of not knowing where the corium is and having no way to access it, Japan has okayed a 40-year Fukushima cleanup plan. This despite not knowing how to do it. In their announcement, they even admit that they need to develop robots to start debris removal and will need at least six years to do so. So 40 years, 20 years, 60 years, just kick that can down the road so that the people who are in charge now won't be in charge then and they will be off the hook. Thanks, guys. Special thanks, because now we have learned that TEPCO, the operator of Fukushima Daiichi, was aware of the need to improve the facility's defenses against tsunamis more than two years before the March 11, 2011 disaster began. But they failed to take action. This was according to an internal company document from a meeting in September 2008. That's when TEPCO executives agreed that building coastal offenses to defend the plant against tsunami higher than those previously recorded in the region was, quote, unquote, indispensable. And then they did nothing. And yet TEPCO has always insisted that it was powerless to take precautions against a tsunami of the size that struck and destroyed the Fukushima Daiichi facility. Now comes word that Japan is planning to restart the nuclear power facility in Sendai, as of July, despite being surrounded by five active volcanoes. What could go wrong? In the ongoing Japan-Fukushima food fight, 
Japan has asked China to ease food import restrictions that they introduced after the Fukushima disaster began. China banned imports of food produced in 10 prefectures in Japan, including Miyagi, Nagano, and Fukushima, immediately after the nuclear crisis. But China's ongoing stance contradicts Japan's claim that Fukushima is a OK and the food is just wonderful. And why don't all you folks come on down to the 2020 radioactive、uh, Tokyo Olympics? Regarding radiation levels that food is exposed to, in a river near Fukushima, radioactive cesium contamination levels rise in the spring and fall. This, according to a new study, if there's radiation in the water, There's radiation in the food. And sometimes the impact of radiation on food is framed as a good thing. A farmer from Fukuoka in Japan, which is 838 miles away from Fukushima, grew a Guinness Book of Records worthy strawberry. 250 grams or 8.82 ounces, more than three inches around. Note that one of the side effects of exposure to radiation is that plants undergo what is called fasciation, which is a hyper growth spurt that leads to gigantism and mutation in the plants. My source article stated that mutations can occur for a variety of reasons and cited frost damage effects to flowers of the strawberry plant, obfuscation, misdirection, and, oh yes, Institutionalized cover ups. In a truly wasted opportunity, foreign journalists were taken on a press junket to visit the Fukushima nuclear plant disaster site. Fourteen journalists from eleven countries took part and not one of them asked tough questions, leading each to return back to their home media organization with a t shirt that read, My journalist went to Fukushima and all he brought me back was this lousy puff piece. The South Korean government has begun its first decommissioning of a nuclear generating station in history after 37 years of operation. Shutting it down before the plan 40 years expires. Cool. A new central repository for radioactive waste has opened in the Chernobyl exclusion zone in Ukraine. A perfect place for it. The center will house thousands of sources of radioactive waste, byproducts of construction, engineering, and many other industries from the past 50 years. And you've all been patient, so here it is. Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Pierre Franck Chevet, the head of France's nuclear watchdog, ASN, Shocked, I say shocked the country's mainly pro-nuclear establishment in April when he and the organization disclosed that state-controlled Areva nuclear had found weak spots in the steel of its flagship European pressurized reactor, EPR, which is being built in Normandy. Chevet called these anomalies serious, even very serious. Yes, that's really shocking. But what ruffled the feathers in France's nuclear industry is the fact that he was so vocal about his concerns instead of waiting for the outcome of further tests. In fact, it prompted retired executives from EDF, the UK's nuclear giant, to write him an unusually blunt letter calling ASN's decision to go public on EPR's problems an abuse of power. OMG! You are telling the truth about nuclear. How dare you? Andre Pellin, a former member of EDF's national crisis team, wrote, allowing oneself to publicly heap opprobrium on the industrial abilities of a national economic player like Areva based on fragile presumptions at a strategic moment in its history does not seem to be in the remit of ASN. He went on to say, What's irritating a bit is the spectacular fashion of his performance. It's like these people have no sense of the state's greater good. No, dude. He has a sense of what his job is. And if this guy and ASN are saying that this is a serious problem, it's a serious problem with a nuclear reactor. Is it in the better interest of France to have a nuclear accident? 
Is it in the state's greater good to build a nuclear reactor which already contains a known flaw which could lead to a catastrophic failure? Nah. French industry is worried about the damage the EPR's problems could do to its image abroad. I swear this is playing like an episode of South Park. Chevet, to his credit, is asserting the true role of ASN as an independent authority and nuclear watchdog. But this is nuclear. They don't want watchdogs. They don't want quality or safety. They want profits. They want image. They are out of their frickin' minds. And that's why... Andrew Pellin and all you other image-conscious, priority-challenged nuclear nutcases, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seat, None Nuts of the Week. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, from the United States Senate to the uranium mines of Africa, Nuclear Hot Seat is there giving you the cutting-edge information, the best that we can come up with. The goal in this, the start of our fifth year, is to expand the show so that it has better quality, greater reach, more influence, and gets you the information that you need to truly understand what is going on in the nuclear issue, no matter where it pops up. So if you have the ability to do so, we would appreciate a donation to help us keep going. If you find that Nuclear Hot Seat makes you laugh, think, helps you understand the nuclear issues and not be so alone with your awareness, let alone gives you a chuckle when I start going really sarcastic. Help us keep doing it. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red Donate button. Whatever you can do to help. I, we, and everyone here at Nuclear Hot Seat, thank you. While I was at the World Uranium Symposium in Quebec City in April, which was an incredible experience seeing all those international activists, I got a chance to get into some great conversations with them, and many of these people are going to be interviewed in upcoming episodes of Nuclear Hot Seat. We're going to start with Urs Rug, a Swiss scientist and professor who is a member of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, or IPPNW. He is a Swiss scientist and professor who presented at the symposium on the health risks posed by nuclear mining. He spoke to us from his home in Bern, Switzerland. Ulf Hug, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Hello, Libby. That's uh, nice to hear you. Let's start out with giving people just a brief sense of what your background is. Basically, I'm a pharmacologist and university professor in Geneva, but I live in Basel. You are a member of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, or IPPNW. When did you become involved with the organization, and what attracted you to it? I am a member, but only since about uh, three and a half years. Uh, The reason I uh, became involved with them is because a good friend of mine, he asked me to join them to help them solve scientific questions and go into matters the scientific way. And so that was was the technical reason. The more, I would say, ethical reason is that I've always been interested in helping somehow to improve the world. And in this case, uh, it is an important issue, I think, to look into uranium from the point of view, of course, of the bomb, of uh, nuclear power plants, as well as uh, at the moment we have a lot of activities in terms of mining uranium and other heavy metal mining. So that is the reason why I got involved uh, with this organization. Every year, the IPTNW, in association with Physicians for Social Responsibility and other groups with vested interests in nuclear issues, have produced the World Nuclear Symposium, among other events. You have now presented at some of these symposia. What was the focus of your talks? This time I I talked about mechanisms of toxicity 
and effects of uh, heavy metals and of uranium in particular on biological matter. So what are the effects of radiation, of gamma, alpha, beta radiation on cells uh, and tissues, which uh, parts of the body, which organs are affected by radiation. And the second one is, of course, the heavy metal effect, which uh, the same questions, which are the targets of uranium and uh, other similar heavy metals in the body. And of course, it's to a large extent uh, known that kidneys are important targets, but many other, other targets are affected in terms of organ. What do you find when you speak with people who are not necessarily part of an anti-nuclear movement, who are not understanding of the kinds of things that we discuss. What are their most common misconceptions about radiation exposure and the effects that you are so familiar with? Well, it depends on uh, many people are not aware that uh, radiation can cause damages that are long-lasting. In other words, it takes a long time, years, tens of years sometimes, that you find out about the effects. And, of course, many are not even aware of the fact that you cannot see, feel, by any of our five senses, <laughs> the radiation. So you have to explain that. Uh, many people are very interested in, in hearing about that. And the other thing is that many people are not aware of the dangers that uh, we still have and the risk uh, of an atomic war that, uh, that will be, of course, maybe the end of mankind. So that is also something that one has to explain them, and that is not necessarily a scientific but also a political issue, of course, that one has to uh, inform people where the risks are and uh, what we can do, hopefully, to prevent these uh, things occurring. Though we don't usually think of Switzerland as a nuclear power or a nuclear country, it does have five reactors in four locations. In May of 2011, right after the start of the Fukushima disaster, there was a call in Switzerland for a nuclear phase-out, and the decision, at least according to my research, was made not to replace these reactors with any new nuclear capacity once the anticipated working lives ended, which would be about 20 years from now. So it would take until 2035 for Switzerland's nuclear power plants to shut down. However, I also discovered that legislation to formalize this phase out still has not been enacted. What's your familiarity with where this now stands? So this is a discussion that's ongoing between the parliament and the executive, the seven ministers. We do have five nuclear reactors. It's true that it has been proposed and I think decided not to replace them, but the timetable of when they should be phased out is still not quite settled. And here there are different views and of course the people who are more close to the nuclear industry, they want to uh, let them go for another 20, 25 years maybe. And some of the other people like us uh, would rather like to face them out more rapidly, uh, especially one that is very old near the capital burn and uh, that has some technical problems already. And so, so that we should face out sooner. So it will depend on what comes out of these negotiations in Parliament within the next year, I think, what will be decided when they will be phased out. But clearly, they will be phased out and not uh, replaced. To what extent does the existence in Switzerland of the World Health Organization and also the World Nuclear Association influence the discussions that are going on in Parliament regarding the nuclear reactors in Switzerland? Well, I would say to a very small extent, it depends on the initiative 
of people in Parliament, in Senate or Congress, to go and search for information and talk to to the people there. But very few people in Parliament do that, actually. And they are mostly from the Green Party, the ecologists. The international organizations otherwise uh, do not try to influence ongoing uh, um, politics in Switzerland. I think it's their general possibility and it's also the case in, in other countries. And just because they are geographically situated here, I don't think that would uh, you know, change the policy on that. IPPNW's next symposium is on the nuclearization of Africa, and it's scheduled to take place this November in Johannesburg, South Africa. Right. So this is IPPNW Switzerland together with similar organization that has decided about six years ago to look into uranium mining because the mining activities are quite devastating in many countries. Historically, also in the U.S. there was mining, but now it has all stopped. Actually, it has not stopped completely. The mines are being revived, including one in the Grand Canyon. We're part of the uranium problem, too, but as you were explaining about this event coming up in November in South Africa. Right. So Africa is a target of mining companies because of weak laws or regulations regarding mining, because there are, is uranium, of course, and there is an enormous workforce to work in the mines for relatively low cost. So, historically, our organization has set up a meeting, a congress in Mali, uh, in Bamako. There is already mining and more is being planned. And the organization got a number of experts from all over the world there to present their views and experience. And on the other hand, people who live there and work in mines or are living near mines and seeing the problems associated with mining, came and listened, presented their views. And that was a good interaction. And then in 2013, in uh, autumn also, was a meeting in Tanzania on mining. And that was very impressive to see all the people who live in an area where mining was being planned we basically rented buses for them, and some four to five hundred came to the meeting and listened to us, and then they talked about themselves in an incomprehensive language and decided what they should be doing politically to boycott the mining because it would affect lots of farming lands there that would afterwards cannot be used anymore. Because, you know, the machinery would just scrap up their land and also would use all the, lots of the water there and uh, it's in a dry area like in Mali, Niger and other countries in northern or middle central uh, to northern Africa too, the Sahel countries. So the water problem is a big problem because the mining takes a lot of water and it usually is taken in the arid zones from the groundwater pumped up, and then it just lies there, contaminated with radiation and heavy metal and other stuff, sometimes also organic matter that fouls away and then goes down and can, of course, contaminate groundwater and make it absolutely unusable for the next uh, few billion years. At that Congress, I was very impressed how the people were full of energy and enthusiasm to try to boycott the mining. Politicians were there too, even one of the people from the mining ministry and the Minister of Health of Tanzania came, gave a, a good speech about all the measures they would be willing to take to circumvent the problems, but of course we are aware that the problems can be only circumvented in very limited amount, and so it's basically a problem that cannot uh, be con fully contained. So there was discussions about that. 
And this politician is the problem in, in Africa and in other places of, of the world is also corruption when mining permit was given out in a southern Tanzania. It seems that these symposia put on by IPPNW and PSR and the aligned groups have served as lightning rods to allow people in these countries to speak truth, to perhaps influence government, but to get word out about what the dangers are and hopefully actions that can be taken within the country to turn around or perhaps stop the uranium mining that is going on. Would that be accurate? Yes, I think that is is the right right thing. And uh, and so I think in Tanzania we were quite successful because the people were successfully resistant to the mining industry and were able to convince the politicians not to give out more mining permits. So that is good. And what's good is also that we, you know, we can deliver information, bring all what we know about mining and the associated problems out there, discuss it, and then let people think, absorb it, and then come to their own conclusions. So, so we do not want to be missionaries in the classical sense, but rather information providers. At the next meeting, which will be in South Africa in Johannesburg from the 16th to the 19th of November, we'll have one day that will be dedicated to Niger because originally our plan was to go into the Sahara, the Sahel, again Niger and have it there. But due to the activities of the terrorist groups there, Boko Haram, um, we were told it, that it's not a very good idea with associated risks. And so we, we dropped that. And so we will um, sponsor the trips of 10 people uh, from Niger to South Africa, and they will present their views and will discuss with them, of course, in French, um, at, at the problems there in Niger. I see that in addition to the information on uranium mining and the dangers involved with that, that there's also going to be an exhibit in Johannesburg of -of state-of-the-art technologies to deal with genuinely renewable energy sources that can harvest and convert solar, biomass, and wind energies. Now, this was not an aspect of the program that I saw at the World Uranium Symposium in Quebec City earlier this year. Is this a new aspect of IPPNW's work to not only raise awareness of the problem, but to propose and hopefully promote some solutions? Yes, I think that is always a a good way if you uh, criticize some system or activity, I think it always go to uh, offer, offer an alternative solution. So that is an idea of uh, Andreas Niedecker, a uh, colleague in IPPNW and one of the leading people uh, in the our Swiss uh, League, to bring these institutions that have uh, equipment that can produce energy by alternative mechanisms. So we live to have there, as you say, wind and solar and also water, energy, machinery, and people who are experts in these. And uh, as you know, solar energy is very abundant and probably one of the best means of uh, producing lots of energy, electric energy. And so we'll have people with experience in that and also somebody who lives in, I think, Kenya or Congo who has already set up a station and who got people involved in these technologies in that country. And so he will talk about his uh, experience. To what extent is there also going to be a conscious outreach to the government in South Africa and in other countries of Africa to have them send representatives to the symposium. This is being organized by Mariette Lieferink, who is the main South African organizer 
and a woman who has been very, very active uh, in the problem of mining in the area of Witwatersrand, which is west of the capital of, uh, west of the city of Johannesburg. And she has been contacting the local government, which she knows already from her almost daily activities, where she tries to protect people who live near mines from the consequences of the mining. So the local people have been invited, and also some of the government of South Africa people have been invited, but I'm not sure how successful she has been with the uh, with these people if they are accept to come like it was the case in Tanzania but it is always important that they come present their views that can be discussed and then that they listen to our views and that usually works out very well and of course the press will be there that was also an important issue with press conferences at the beginning in the middle and at the end of the mm-hmm. symposium. Will you be attending in South Africa? And if so, will you be presenting again? Yes, I will be both. I will be attending and presenting again. You know, the consequences of mining and maybe uh, some other medical problems associated with uranium. I mean, not only mining, but also the uh, examples from Chernobyl and from Fukushima. Well, we wish you every success at the symposium in South Africa and all good fortune with getting the point across to local government so that we can stop the uranium from being taken out of the ground because that's where the entire nuclear fuel cycle starts. And if we can close it off at one end, then there's hope that eventually we'll be able to close it off at the other. Yes, thank you very much for your good wishes. I also wish you all the best with the future of your organizations that you have initiated and are doing so well. I must, I was always impressed by the, by new knowledge and the way you go about to transport it into the public via your uh, weekly emissions of the nuclear hot seat. So all the best to you. Thank you so much, and thank you for being my guest on Nuclear Hot Seat. That was Urs Grug of IPPNW Switzerland. The contact information for the Nuclearization of Africa Symposium is conference2015 at uranium-network.org, and we will have a link up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode number 209. Two corrections to the interview. At one point, I misspoke when I referred to the World Nuclear Symposium, when I meant the World Uranium Symposium. And Munchkin's editorializing was strictly her own and does not represent the views of Nuclear Hot Seat or myself. Here's today's final thought. I've been reluctant to report on this show the weekly degradation and catastrophic sea deaths along the Pacific Coast because it's just too depressing. Also, we don't have proof. For all that we suspect that Fukushima is behind it, there is not yet anything incontrovertible to show that we are right, though I really do suspect that we are. But it's an old axiom that proximity is not causality, and without being able to put the pieces together in a way that can't be shaken or stirred, I've been reluctant to claim this building cataclysm as one of ours, as something rooted in nuclear. Still, reading reports this week of the multi-species deaths to Pacific life forms and the consistency with which so-called experts are scratching their heads and saying, gee, Georgia, I can't figure it out, it's a mystery, makes me want to pop my cork. None of those so-called experts seems to be willing to publicly say the F-word, Fukushima, in connection with what is currently happening along the Pacific Coast. Every story, every story, and I read as much as I can in the course of the week, everyone that comes from a so-called official source 
includes some intentional disclaimer or misdirection to make people not look at Fukushima as a possible, if not probable, underlying cause. The triple meltdown site still releases 300 tons or more of radioactive water every day, and levels of radiation in the port water, meaning the Pacific Ocean, is at astronomical, unprecedented levels. Now, maybe there's not enough radiation, even boring directly out of Fukushima in a given day, to kill a whale directly. But it can mutate or kill plankton, which impacts the small fish that eat the plankton, which impacts the slightly larger fish that eat the smaller fish, and so on up the food chain. Fish are impacted and die off and break the food chain so that those further up don't get the food that they need, and so they die. Now, if you will remember last year and even the year before, 2013 and 2014, when there was a mass swarming of whales, seals, fish, pelicans, and other seabirds along the coastal waters off Santa Cruz in Northern California, again, the so-called experts scratched their heads and made excuses for what might be causing it. To me, it was obvious. What I saw was the forest fire scene in Bambi, where all the animals flee from the frames to make their escape, and most of them were successful. Similarly, I saw these marine animals fleeing from the flames of the Fukushima forest fire of radioactive water. Only they ran out of ocean and couldn't go any further. They had no escape onto land. So they turned around and went back to the ocean to face what it was that they were trying to avoid. And now they're washing up on our shores, dead or dying. This is again personal. Not 30 miles from where I record this show, sea life is dying in unprecedented numbers. Now, maybe it is a toxic algae bloom, the largest in history, as is being said. But what's causing the algae bloom? And how long do the so-called experts think that they can continue to cover up the most likely cause of this catastrophe with their ignorance, be it real or feigned, before they're going to have to look at the one thing no one wants to look at, the life-changing, inescapable, ongoing fact of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. The way to guarantee a time of panic in the populace is to delay speaking a difficult truth. Folks, I'll do it. The emperor is bare-assed naked. Where are the oceanographers, scientists, public health officials willing to at least consider that possibility? And how much worse will it have to get before they do? Because trust me, this only is not going away. It's only going to get worse. And I predict that someday soon we will have the ugly, painful, undeniable truth confirmed that Fukushima is killing the Pacific Ocean and everything within it. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 23rd, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, npr.org, Mainichi Shimbun, CBS TV, ABC TV, NBC TV, Vancouver Sun, LA Times, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, Washington Post, AP, Reuters, KMXTFM, Weather Channel, miningawareness.wordpress.com, Natural News, dailycaller.com, Baltimore Sun, nuclear-news.net, akinstandard.com, fukushima-diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, Arnie Gunderson and Fairwinds Energy Education, penenergy.com, scmp.com, Kyoto, World Truth TV, japannews.com, timesalive.co.za, sputniknews.com, the bitter Jern School washouts, 
who have chosen to demean themselves by working at WorldNuclearNews.com, and the cool, refreshingly delicious members of the Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com and iTunes under podcasts. Our archive is available on the website or on iTunes, and our YouTube channel carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Radiation from the Fukushima nuclear disaster is now washing up on the shores of Canada's Vancouver Island. Low levels of radioactive isotopes identified with the Japanese power plant were discovered in February off Euclid, British Columbia, some 4,700 miles away. It's the first time radiation has been detected on land in North America since the 2011 nuclear plant meltdown. Scientists stress the levels of radioactive chemicals are not harmful. In November, the Canadian government detected airborne elements of radioactive pollutants in seawater vegetation further off the shores of British Columbia. I'm Matt Sampson. The we-, we are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. We're going to go out on a song sung by Tom English, written by Tom and Myla Reason, and performed here at a meeting held in May at the Malibu Democratic Club. The song is based on a conversation Tom tried to have with an engineer while at a meeting with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Southern California Edison prior to the closure of the San Onofre Nuclear Power Station. The song is What Part of Fukushima Do You Not Understand? Thanks to Mary Beth Brangan and Jim Heddle of Eon 3 for their use of the recording. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we all need to contact the U.S. Democratic senators who voted for Fast Track for the TPP and give them a piece of our anti-nuclear minds. So now, don't go back to sleep, because truly, we are all in the nuclear hot seat. At one point, I said to him, um... Uh, you know, and of course, we really also have to include it, you know, in everything we're discussing, you know, the reality of what's happening in Fukushima. And he said, well, <clears throat> if you want to discuss this rationally, we can talk about this. But if you're going to be illogical and irrational, <laughs> we can't. Yeah, and emotional, we can't. We, we can't discuss this. So I said, what part of Fukushima do you not understand when nuclear contamination hits the fan plutonium is everywhere it's in the sea it's in the air and we don't even have any evacuation plan what part of fukushima do you not understand what Part of Fukushima did you somehow miss when sure shooting every time with things like this? Destruction rages like a flame, officials playing, spin the blame, and all of us are bracing, racing, facing the abyss. What part of Fukushima did you somehow miss? Humankind is humankind, and we all make mistakes. Hard sometimes to not be blind and fall for fakes. But even now, before our eyes, it's in the sea, it's in the skies. You know we best prioritize air, water. Come on, guys. What part of Fukushima do you need clarified? What happens when the plate tectonics slip and slide and then it blows what happens then it isn't if you know it's when and everybody petrified nowhere to run nowhere to hide what part of fukushima do you not understand how then can even fema ever lend a hand the time to make the break is now to wind and wave and solar power if 
We're gonna live. Nuclear power must be banned. Wrap your mind round Fukushima. It's no time to be a dreamer. It's no time to be a schemer. Google Fukushima, take a stand. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.